Well, I really find it fascinating. I was watching the news the other night, and you uh, you fired this uh, fired this thing up a little bit, right? Oh, well, four engines. <laughs> Bang associated with the um, caution and warning them. Okay, as we have an apparent serious oxygen leak. Four, three, two, one. Oh, uh, here's the way that about. He's in a row and he can't stop it. Performing an evasive maneuver. Hello and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we walk you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, Chris, a sleepy Chris, and today we are rejoined by Scott to talk about Sea Dragon, the biggest rocket ever designed. Scott, thank you for coming back on. Hello, it's me again. If you haven't listened to our first episode on Sea Dragon, go do that. Scott here is our resident industry expert on rockets, uh, who we inflicted with, or I inflicted it on him and Chris last time, uh, the story of just the biggest, dumbest booster ever made. Not made, designed. Every time, I mess that up. I'd like to once again reiterate that expert is an extremely strong word to describe me. <laughs> I, want, oops, I said that, I said that the get. first time. I will see the best we can get. <laughs> best week, Scott. Best we can get. There we go. Yes. That's... <laughs> Perhaps a tad insulting, also perhaps asterisk. a tad true. I'll take it. <laughs> but you know what we can say? Industry expert. Uh, you are asterisk. the subject matter expert. Haha. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah, you know, you know more about rockets, and I don't want to be mean about this, but you know more about rockets and uh, projects failing. Ooh. Ouch. Oh, low right. low. shot right. through the heart. Oh. Oh, it is a little bit. <laughs> Ask me about my time in New Mexico. Oh, boy. Oh, no. It's a cursed place. Other Chris, you were not here last time and you also apparently failed to do your homework. Uh, so you're going to get you're going to get some fun, uh, some extra fun for this as like the stuff that we are already used to with Sea Dragon, all these dumb ideas. You're just going to get blindsided by them. I am so ready. You Chris, do not even understand. To be X. Who? You think I'm not already? <laughs> yes. So, audience, this is part two of our series on Sea Dragon, the largest rocket ever designed. Uh, so, part one, we talked more about the rocket itself, how its design project went, and how it failed, and why it failed. Uh, this time, we're going to talk about the lunatic who made it and his incredibly fun life, both before and after designing Sea Dragon. So, have you guys ever heard of a little guy called Bob Truax? Yes. Yes, and it has been Wait, everything you have? in my power to not Google him. Okay. Okay, so you've heard it from me occasionally telling you that we're going to talk about. That's not what the question... Uh, I'm, it's been everything in my power. The spirit of I've, the question... You mean right. before you told us about him? No, I would have never. Y- okay, known. Yes. beforehand, All yes, right. I have heard the name. Okay, so you, you've heard the name from somewhere, and let's see if that comes up in this story. It might be from Sea Dragon. It might be from, uh, it was from a lot C-Dragon of other dumb Jason. stuff he's done. Okay. All right. Uh, So that question was entirely pointless, um, and the audience is no more informed for having heard it. My apologies. I have overall degraded the quality of the podcast. I will go to the detention chamber. This is also probably a great time to tell you guys, uh, audience, that we have a Patreon. And if you want to support more incompetence like this, or optimally, pay us to be less incompetent. Uh, you can find the link to that below. If you sign up right now at any of the tiers, you'll also get one of uh, our bonus episodes. We just reviewed a Soviet teen movie, uh, which was kind of dumb. That's I, one that hell of a sales word. pitch. Yeah, that is not the word I would use to describe that movie. You want to listen to us reviewing a Soviet masterpiece in film, but a master. That is not what we are here for. That was the obligatory plug. Uh, hopefully that was around 30 seconds. So you could have skipped past it and be right now. Uh, We're here to talk about Bob Truax, a genius, a lunatic, probably my new favorite space guy. Those things often overlap. I know. Genius and lunatic. (laughs) He he is a tortured genius in a very literal sense, it sounds. And for part two of this story, uh, the main thing I'm going to be sourcing is the book Great Mambo Chicken and the Transhuman Condition by Ed Regis. That is a title. 
Sorry. Um, that, oh, whoa, man. okay. How do we link that to this? Uh, so, to, so to give you a bit of an idea, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, Great Mambo Chicken and the Transhuman Condition is basically like a, it's a book of profiling a bunch of weird auteur geniuses. I believe it was written around the 90s. So like he talks to a bunch of weird guys who are trying to do weird stuff and are just like completely obsessed. Uh, so like there's one guy who's obsessed with freezing his brain. There's one guy who's obsessed with like digitizing the consciousness and stuff like that. And Truax in this book is the weird guy who is obsessed with building rockets. I mean, if you think about it, heavy lift is what just allows you to do so much more stupid stuff. Yeah. So Bob, or I guess he's Robert. So Bob Truax got his start in rocketry as a kid in Alameda, California in the 1920s, launching model rockets he made with a friend. His friend was the structural engineer, which meant it was his job to whittle the rockets out of balsa wood. Little Bobby Truax, meanwhile, was in charge of propulsion, which meant loading the rockets with gunpowder he got from stealing shotgun shells. I love this guy already. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I love about this dude's engineering style is that it never changes through his entire life. He will keep all of it, everything he engineers will continue to be the idea of like build it cheap and build it out of garbage. This sounds like my Boy Scouts experience. I love, yeah, I, 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 love, I love this guy. I love and this he, guy. And he takes that same thing, like objectively with all of these stories. And, and he actually doesn't wind up being too bad of a dude. All of these stories are awesome. The story of Gerald Bull is awesome until he turns into a bad person <laughs> and then it becomes bad. You know? I, I, I love that guy. Like, whenever, whenever a bad person does a cool thing, it's bad. But whenever a good person does it, it rocks. I. <laughs> I find it so hard to hate Gerald Bull. Yeah. And and right now, little Bobby Truax, he still rocks. So he's building shotgun rockets, which, you know, predictably exploded. And when that happened, the two started to experiment. Uh, so Truax's buddy built bigger and stronger rockets while he worked on building an engine that wouldn't immediately detonate. Um, he tried all kinds of different materials for the combustion chamber, something to hold the gunpowder and actually direct the force downward. Everything from paper straws to metal CO2 canisters. He even started mixing up his own crude solid rocket fuel out of saltpeter, gunpowder, gum arabic, and other chemicals he found around town. I will note that this is literally how several early rocket pioneers died. So I was about to ask, how many fingers does this guy have? <laughs> he has all of them. <laughs> oh, uh, he does not number. die. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He, he doesn't die, and he made his greatest discovery yet. A local movie theater had thrown out a bunch of celluloid film, and for those who don't know, celluloid film burns real good. I have indeed seen the documentary in Glorious Bastards, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, a, there's a little thing, right? I think it's called the nitrocellulose. Is there maybe, like, extra flammable film? Yeah, you, you just add a nitro... <laughs> Or just, uh, what's it called? You add nitrogen group to it. All right, well, just... now I'm just picturing putting nitrous on the actual, like, the thing, the uh, the projector, so it spins real fast. I mean, <laughs> and, like, it? Play, and it can play an entire movie in five seconds. Listen, we're hitting 120 frames per second in the 20s. I mean, the only problem is, on average, 20% of the theater goers will die, but that's what you pay for fine art. This wasn't that, that was still kind of in the era when um, building code wasn't really a thing a suggestion it was more of a suggestion how many how many like theater disasters had there been like within the last oh, 100 God. years of 1920 <laughs> i was gonna say the big thing isn't theater disasters it's nightclub disasters so little bobby truax he finds this celluloid film and he like he grabs as much as he can carry and he packs it into a rocket from great mambo chicken Quote, this one burst at a height of several feet and scattered strips of flaming celluloid all over the backyard. To Bob Truex, one of the major appeals of rocketry was always the sound of a good engine burn. It's a very sexy sound, a very impressive sound. It's a high-pitched whoosh, like a jet engine, but there's an unsteadiness to it. Because when a supersonic jet comes into a quiescent medium, it creates a periodic turbulence. But it gives you an emotional response of some kind. Actually, I think a lot of the reason for being enthusiastic about rockets, for some, it's a vocation, for some, an avocation, and for some, it's almost a religion. Well, the noise has got to have something to do with it. I'm sorry. I like I, how that I, quote, <laughs> like, I, a, a nice Zap Brannigan voice. <laughs> it's a very sexy sound. It's a very sex <laughs> sexy, sexy, sexy I, I identify with this guy so much. Like, this is, this is me at air shows. 
Like losing losing my mind. All of yeah, audience, this is why we bring the rocket guy on. All of us are making fun of this quote. And Scott <laughs> Scott's like, just like yeah, my yeah, this God, guy he's he's so real. Car guys and rocket guys do have that shaking hands meme of <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. It's it's all about that roar, you know? Yeah. On the when you're at like an yeah, air, like when you're at like an air you, show, and you the, physically feel it in your chest. Yes. I, love, yeah. I love how the the Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Carl Weathers handshake is immortal as 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 an imagery. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <It's just laughs> <That> means- <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, like uh, we will see in quotes later, I'm kind of convinced that Truex is a rocket sexual. Um, this is something that, like, are you saying we'll, that we'll he get has there. a rocket goon cave oh god if if any descendants are listening know that i do think bob truex was a really cool dude please do not sue me this comes out of a place of love so so he yes. wants like aeromorphs but of rockets shut yes. up <laughs> do not this guy this guy, is, this guy is way too early for our non-credible defense <laughs> Uh, it turns out that making thi- like being horny for stuff has always been a thing and <laughs> always will be a thing. Uh, I'm cu- I'm cutting this. Some of my co some of my coworkers listen to this. Some of my coworkers are on. You're gonna this make episode. you're gonna make me sound so weird for earlier saying, "Man, I identify with this guy so much. It's a sexy sound." Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> me at me at air shows when like the the aircraft turns and you like the jet engines. You hear that roar? That like. <gasps> Ah uh, yes, there it is. He is here. Don't Please. don't don't put me in the same boat as whatever you're painting this as. I'm just okay. No 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 no. Yeah, I, I'll 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 cut it. I'll cut around it. I'll make it sound classy. <laughs> all right. So so basically, you can imagine how all of this experience with rockets would like shape a kid's enthusiasm, uh, especially because around the 1920s and 30s, rockets were just entering the public eye. And they were viewed as this incredible new science fiction technology. Truex grew up reading about legendary rocket pioneers like Max Vallier, Fritz von Opel, and Robert Goddard. These were formative, but not as much as the incredibly popular comic book, The Adventures of Buck Rogers. Oh, yes. The plot is as follows. Buck Rogers is a World War I pilot who falls into a coma and wakes up in the year 2430. Buck travels the universe, fights villains, and saves the day wherever he goes. It's basically Futurama. For a whole generation of kids, this is incredibly formative. This is the first time that they are learning about space and they're learning about rockets. And this like kickstarts the first generation of people who want to do space stuff, uh, including Bob Truax. Doesn't like a ton of sci-fi get inspired from specifically Buck Rogers too? Yes. Whenever this comic comes out, it spawns a whole bunch of imitators one of those is Flash Gordon. Right. Flash Gordon started off as a Buck Rogers ripoff. And then from Flash Gordon, you get like Star Wars and whatnot. Yeah. So, huh. There's a direct so, so the entire here. family tree of a lot of like sci fi comic entertainment all kind of comes back to Buck Rogers. So what you're saying is Buck Rogers is the gene seed. Uh, um, uh, maybe, maybe not. I haven't done enough research to know if there's stuff that, you know, was f- very formative before Buck Rogers. I do just know that it has like an incredibly huge influence. I'm not going to say it's the most. Or like the start of everything. Yeah, because you get like, what's, is, is it, oh god, I don't know my historical sci-fi enough. Uh, is it Jules Verne who's got the book with the guy who gets to the moon from being launched out of a cannon? Yeah, yeah. The, the moon gets shot in the eye. Yeah, but like yeah. as far as comic books aimed at children that like inspire kids to want to get into this stuff, Buck Rogers is is it. Now, between the fantastical visions of the future and the examples set by rocket visionaries like Goddard, Bob Truax grew up knowing that rocketry would be the driving force of his life, and he carried this on to his studies, eventually winning a spot at the U.S. Naval Academy in Maryland. Considering everything I've told you about Bob Truax, you might expect him to have some problems with the military, some maybe some problems with discipline, especially because first-year students at the academy, called plebes by other students, got to deal with all kinds of unique and inventive hazing rituals. Oh boy. Oh boy. Is this sure. the tortillas? No, the tortillas come later. I admittedly have not done a load of research into this, but from Bob's recollection, most of these hazing rules just involved being as robotic as possible. Plebes would have to march down the exact center of every hallway and could only turn with a left or right face, so like a 90 degree military turn. <laughs> <laughs> then there were these square meals where plebes would have to eat with straight robotic motions. So raise food to mouth height, 
move food horizontally to mouth, take a bite, repeat. <laughs> Yeah, so they're getting hazed hard. <laughs> That's not. I, I was expecting when you started talking about like hazing in military academies. Oh, like yeah, this, the, this could have gone to a dark place. But at the same time, it's the 1920s, so I'm sure there was like bad, bad hazing. Yeah. I just couldn't find any of it. Most it's probably of this just is what from Truax's recollection. Yeah, right. Uh, like this is just the kind of fun stuff. He did talk about yeah, this is the fun. This is the fun boys being boys, forcing each other to be robots for a while. And despite what we know about this kid, uh, Bob Truex actually thrived in the military. He found the rules more neat than restrictive, and he also got his share of pranks in, too. His specialty was crawling under the dinner table and setting <laughs> upper years shoes on fire. <laughs> Sorry, that's ca casual pranks. Start committing arson. Yeah, and they're just he's just like, well, I did it in straight robotic motion, so you really can't be mad at me. <laughs> My 90 degree angles were so crisp. Watching all the first years slowly eating their slop with like 90 degree robot motions and then suddenly your feet are on fire and you have third degree <laughs> burns and that weird kid, the weird rocket kid is laughing. So he is he's a he's a pyromaniac, right? Like yes. that's yeah. Clear, like we're seeing this here we're seeing this with the shotgun just, <laughs> again this kid could have totally fit into my my boy scout troop yeah it all tracks it all, yeah it all totally tracks boy scouts <laughs> basically a safe haven for pyromaniacs everywhere and all through school he didn't stop doing rocketry from great mambo chicken quote there was plenty of shop machinery available, but not much time to use it. So Truex was forced to compress all of his hardware work into a frenzied half hour between the end of classes and the start of evening formation. About 4.30 each afternoon, he'd get out of class and run at top speed over to the steam engineering building a half mile away, where the machine shop was. Not only did he have evening formation to worry about, but there was the added annoyance that the shop's electric power was regularly turned off at 5 o'clock. With only 30 minutes to use the lathe, drill press, and other equipment, Truax became a fast master of the TLAR, or That Looks About Right, School of Rocket Construction, which I also relate to. Just slime a carbide bit into it, it hasn't exploded, you're good. Yeah, fuck it, yeah, she'll fly. Even, even once he becomes a professional, he never gets away from the TLAR stuff. He's just, ah, fuck it. I mean, what is tool life when you don't have to worry about it? <laughs> oh, God, this guy would have looked at, like, a single shadow boarded tool, like a bunch of shadow boarded tools and just had a heart attack immediately. <laughs> Are you telling me I can readily access everything and everything has a home? No, heresy. Get rid of it. Dude, the amount of tools that would have like built up inside of an operational Sea Dragon rocket as like engineers and technicians just like chuck stuff in there. Yeah, what is FOD? I oh, you read my mind on Listen, that one. If your if your rocket is big enough, it can't get damaged by tiny FOD. You just have to get bigger <laughs> than the FOD. But then at the same at the same time, once your rocket is that big, FOD is like You've accidentally ingested an entire tugboat and it's like just rattling around in the pipes. I'm pretty sure at that point the FOD becomes an advantage if you ever manage to get into orbit because, huh, I need a socket yeah. wrench. Just open up a panel and they explode. Oh, out. here it is. Going into those areas also exposes you to near lethal amounts of asbestos. I, hey, oh, yeah, don't forget. Don't forget about the asbestos. Hey, it, it's the wonder material of the century. <laughs> asbestos is the bestest. <laughs> Why do you, like every single material that is horrific for human health is amazing for its properties? Yeah, it's actually yeah, incredible how wonderful of a like of material asbestos is minus the cancer. Like, let's talk about asbestos, lead, hydrazine. Yep. Mercury is another good one there, too. Like, it's so useful. Th this is just more of an argument for, like, the people who prefer unmanned probes to manned missions of just like, see, humans just get in the way. Like, the body is just <laughs> not good. The it's body stupid reacts meats, negatively stupid meat to sacks. all of these chemicals. So then we all become transhumanists. Yeah, then we can make... If we become all become transhumanists, we can make all our buildings out of asbestos again. It'll so be great. what you're saying yes. is we're all going to <laughs> join the ad back. <laughs> <laughs> so back to Truax, he also learned how to pilot a few planes, getting experience by basically volunteering to do ferry flights anytime, like in the Navy, in the Air Force and all of these, like they need these planes moved from place to place. So he would just volunteer to just be like, yo, I'll just take that. I'll fly it wherever. They just let him do this. Yeah. So why, why did he get his pilot's license and all this? Presumably by, while doing the ferry flights. I guess it is like the 1920s. Like, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's like, that's that's your left wing. That's your right wing. Get in, son. Fuck. 
we're talking about the time when a pylon's license was more of a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I've I've actually I've read like a couple like biographies of like various like World War II like pilots and whatnot, and it's amazing how many of them were just like I was a kid hanging out at the airport until like one <laughs> pilot said, "Hey, kid, you want to fly an airplane?" He's like, "Oh yeah, 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 I do." Like how many of them got started just like, like some random dude just let them fly a plane for a while and that's how they got their start oh by the time he left the military truex had flown or flown in 38 different types of aircraft and had in his words less time and more planes than anybody else in the navy he's flown all these kinds of planes and he's got maybe like five hours in each of them i i know we're like still so early in the story i am so jealous of this guy's life (laughs) <laughs> I, I just found like I want to be this guy so bad. I know, I know, because I know that we, like me and you, Scott, have talked about it. My ultimate goal is to get to the level of engineering where I no longer have to do like project work, where my entire job as an engineer is to just do arts and crafts all day. <laughs> and this guy, this guy gets to do that for his entire life. He is never not doing arts and crafts with weird junk he finds. So, funny enough, that's half of what I do. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, That's awesome. (laughs) So after graduating, Truax spent the next two years on sea duty, first on an aircraft carrier, then on a destroyer. And again, he spent all his spare time designing rockets. And this apparently got him noticed because when he got back to Maryland, he was assigned to a research division working on a special rocket project. The idea was to put rockets on Catalina flying boats so they could be launched off of aircraft carriers. This is incredible. (laughs) This is such an incredible slide. This is an early example of what's called RATO, R-A-T-O, or Rocket Assisted Takeoff. Or Chad Launch. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> Have you ever seen Fat Albert before they discontinued it? Oh, oh. yeah. Oh. oh, fuck. Yeah, Rocket Assisted Takeoff is the coolest shit ever. I love that. <laughs> My favorite is Rocket Assisted Landing, like that one C-130 with the pop-out kind of rocket boosters. <laughs> so to provide some context to that, that plane was in designed to land and take off within a soccer pitch or football for our European wow. audience. And now this is a full on cargo plane. <laughs> yeah, you're just you're just one of you're just one of the troops in the back and you're like, all right, the captain's just like, all right, we're coming in for landing. And suddenly you are rammed to the left <laughs> and with like 15 G's. Your head impacts the other guy's shoulder enough to crack both bones on either side. It really is the Kerbal Space Program of, oh, uh, approach God. to aerospace design. It's just like, well, it doesn't work. Let's just slap some booster rockets on yeah, it. Separate Aye, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, on landing, everyone on that plane gets their own Mortal Kombat finisher scene. <laughs> and then on takeoff, you get the worst TBI you could imagine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, li- I just want to get back. There's this beautiful aircraft already. I oh, had yeah. no idea they radio to pby and and this this is an earlier example so you can see in that picture it's an rcaf aircraft it's taking off from the water oh wait this is this is canadian well no 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 no. uh this is just the picture this is this is just the picture of a of a catalina using uh rato okay we don't actually have pictures of specifically what he was working on and to be clear this is a u.s navy attempt to launch these things off of aircraft carriers with rato so uh i know i mentioned it slightly (laughs) earlier but I did actually get to see a Catalina take off and land on water while being on the water really? myself. Yeah, that, nice. is, that is cool. Nice. Not to go off on like a total tangent. And I know we just talked about like weirdly sexualizing aircraft. So yeah. I, I want to just say, I swear to God, I'm not doing this. Not weirdly sexualizing aircraft. When I say flying boats are the sexiest things I've ever seen in my life. OK, I think Hello, there, is an al- yeah. <laughs> there is an alternate history. Where we went down the flying boat timeline. Uh, the Convair flying fighter or something? No, no, no. There's one? like in the in like the like late 1940s, 1950s. And they're trying For various companies. Are, yeah, planes. various companies are trying to get like mass oh. air transit to be a thing. But nobody has airfields anywhere. So they're like, screw it. We'll integrate with existing infrastructure. We'll, we'll build, build flying boat. Yeah. Build flying boats and you land at cities that are already ports and use that infrastructure. Oh, instead. that is cool. A, a timeline where 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 Howard Hughes's fucking jumbo. Spruce fucking, Goose. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the things World War Two killed, it also killed the flying boat because suddenly everyone started building yeah. airfields everywhere. So for this Rato stuff, since the U.S. Navy needed this system stat, uh, they made two competing teams. Truex was in charge of one of them and Robert Goddard 
his childhood hero and the inventor of the liquid fueled rocket was in charge of the other. Damn. Ooh. So like he's fr he's fresh out of school and he is immediately put up against uh, the most senior rocket designer ever. It's like, congratulations, kid. You made the big leagues. You're on a line with Wayne Gretzky. Let's go. <laughs> You're against Wayne Gretzky. You're against Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> now, Goddard was an early rocket pioneer, but by this point, his ideas were becoming a little dated. For example, almost all his designs had the rocket nozzles at the top because he was a firm believer in the flawed pendulum effect, which was this idea that like the weight of the rocket being below the nozzles would help stabilize it. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense, but there's actually a bunch of uh, physics reasons why this doesn't work. Uh, and Truex actually tried to convince Goddard of this when they met and it did not work. Anyway, Goddard's idea was rocket pods fueled by gasoline and liquid oxygen, but Oxygen is only a liquid when it's cryogenically cooled, which meant having to design all kinds of like incredibly complicated cooling systems into the plane. Truex also thought this arrangement was very unsafe and thought his system was much safer. What's his system? I'm glad you asked. Psychosis. Nitric acid and hydrazine. Yes! Returning champions. Yeah, these are these are hypergolic fuels. And for those who haven't listened to our earlier episodes, a hypergolic means they explode on contact. And as a general safety concern, they hate the human skeleton. Yes. So this is another one of those miracle chemicals that is also horrible for humans. Uh, <laughs> nitric acid, hydrazine, all of these are incredibly toxic and corrosive. Hydrazine is literally the, one of the best rocket fuels ever, unless you don't want to dissolve your astronauts. Yeah. Now, for Truex, this was actually a benefit, since it meant that the rocket didn't need any kind of ignition system and could be relit infinitely. You also don't need an escape system because the pilot will simply <laughs> be evaporated. <laughs> no need for an ejection seat. Now, when he built them, the rocket pods were able to haul the aircraft into the air easily, and his team won the competition. His design would have been mass produced and highly unstable rocket fuel would have been packed onto every American aircraft carrier. Yes. But thankfully, a different team headed up by Theodore von Karman developed solid fuel boosters for Rato, and that sort of put an end to both Truex wait, wait, wait. and Goddard's Hang designs. Hang on a second. This is okay. This episode is turning into like the Avengers of like of rocket, of rocket guys. guys sorry that's von Karman. that's like the von that Karman. theodore von Karman of the von Karman line <laughs> dang okay scott's got all the big names here jeez i worried whenever i was listening to this that it's kind of like like wow i don't know if i totally believe this uh it sounds kind of fan fiction-y that truax goes up against his hero and beats him immediately <laughs> <laughs> who wrote this plot line we At least he then gets slapped down by Von Karman. It's not like, oh, Truax, Truax's own telling of the story is just like, so, I just, I was smarter than all of them. So just to be clear, this is the 1930s and there is a plan to load up U.S. aircraft carriers with hydrazine. Yes. Which then would have seen active combat <laughs> against the Japanese yeah. loaded with hydrazine. And yeah, like a hey. single spark. Would like forget forget even in combat like a single spark some dude smoking too close to them and every like that aircraft carrier would have just gone up. Um, All we know is that the fuel would have burnt off quicker and the fire would have gone out sooner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fire would have gone out real soon, along with oh, everybody's yeah. lives. <laughs> now, after the war, Truax kept at his work in rocket development. Despite being a Navy man, he was assigned to head up the U.S. Air Force's IRBM program, the THOR. Uh, so IRBM here is Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. And Truex, in true, like, rocket engineer fashion, he wanted to turn this into a satellite launcher. He also worked on the U.S. Navy's Viking rocket and the Polaris, what would become the world's first submarine launched missile. Now, I need to be upfront here. I think the source might be a little biased because it says that he invented the missile, and I cannot find anything to corroborate that. Uh, just that he worked on it. Around this time, the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force were all competing with each other over who could build ballistic missiles and launch a satellite faster. In the end, the Army won the satellite race, but the Air Force and Truax won the race to the first American IRBM. So also as a side note here, Truax's rocket, the Thor, would be the basis for the Delta rocket family that is still being flown today. Dang. Yeah. Anyway, after an illustrious military career, Truax joined up with Aerojet as the head of their advanced developments division. What this was, was they gave him a million a year budget and some employees, and they just set him loose to do whatever he wanted. And this is where he develops Sea Dragon and the concept of the big dumb booster. Again, just so jealous of this guy's I life. I know, I know. If I could just be given money and told to go wild. Please just give me a million dollars in 
1930s adjust, or I guess it would have been the 50s by now, right? Yeah. 1950s inflation adjusted money and some employees to just go like dick around at a firing range for a while and blow some stuff off. If I could just have a private skunk works that works exclusively on whatever <laughs> dumb things I invent. That's all I want, please. Like, is that, <laughs> is that too much to ask? <laughs> Listen, I will shove rocket fuel into a tube. I will just, <laughs> just let me, please. <laughs> but even with all of these projects under his belt and a company literally shoveling money to him, Truax wasn't happy. This was office work, drawing, designing, drafting, all that kind of stuff. He wanted something hands-on. He wanted to actually build rockets again like he had when he was a kid. And he got the opportunity when he was approached by race car driver Walt Arfons. Rockets plus race cars. Arfons, I might be pronouncing that name wrong, whatever. Arfons, A-R-F-O-N-S, was part of a group of drag racers who were all competing with each other to make and break new land speed records. Arfons had already won it with cars powered by jet engines, and he figured the best way to keep pushing that record was to move up to rockets. Please tell me these rockets were hydrazine powered. <laughs> Where are we going? It's hydro this? something. And so he asked Truex to build him a rocket car. Bob Truex immediately agreed. Of course he did. <laughs> Of course. Why Health wouldn't you? What does that mean? <laughs> if you had asked Bob Truex if he wanted to do the Wan Who thing and put a rocket on a chair, <laughs> he would have. Yeah, also, we'll figure it out. We, will, we will be talking about this later. Bob Truex may have done the Wan Who thing and put a rocket on I a chair. I was going to say, are you implying that our boy has not? <laughs> uh, yeah, Bo Bob Truex reincarnation of Wan Who. The rocket Hong Christ will not be denied his true calling. <laughs> Great. So, sorry, uh, not not to derail this once again with water bombers, but Chris, you keep sending pictures of more flying boats, and I'm so here for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for like fully engaging with my, my fully supporting my love absolute love flying of boats. flying boats. I see you, and I understand. <laughs> <laughs> like, this oh, is fantastic. Thank too. you. So yeah, Truex is on board. And from his earlier designs, you might expect something complex, packed full of incredibly dangerous fuels. Instead, Truex's idea was to build a steam rocket, basically just a pressure cooker with a nozzle. But uh, uh, you know what else that's called? An explosive. Yeah. <laughs> Truex built it this way because steam rockets are cheap, simple to build and tend to be safer than anything that spews flames or burn nitric acid. And you might notice that I say tend to be safer. Like kind of because... You got to pressurize water or steam quite a lot to get any juice out of it. Like, yeah, you, you, gotta, you need you a big solid a container. Lot. All like, of your components <laughs> are technically, you know, inert. But the problem is they may be inert. But when you get scalding. steam blasted. Yeah, like I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think like a very like a very high pressure pressure vessel with steam is probably more dangerous than like a solid rocket booster. Yeah, but here's here's the issue. The steam is cheap. You talk about steam explosions and I'm having like the Vietnam flashback thing. And like the, the, <laughs> the thing that's fading into view is the Texas City disaster. No. What if we turned an entire Wait. boat into a pressure vessel and then what, exploded what's this story? it? I don't know this story. What? Me neither. We can earmark that for after this episode because I have my own diatribe. Say on it that. now. No. G it... Give us the cliff notes now. Okay. Uh, people being... Uh, dipshits you have a evaporation stack overflowing someone leaves a truck in the vicinity no there's more than one there's more than one texas city disaster is this the boat this is the boat and it's in fact oh! two boats it's two boats something caught fire inside boat all doors are closed boat becomes incredibly hot pressure vessel full of hot gas Boat oh. explodes and annihilates like like the, the 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 anchor the anchor for the boat landed like miles, miles? upon miles Jeez. away. So this is just like steam Halifax disaster. I, I, that's what I was thinking too, Quinn. Like <laughs> like the like the Beirut explosion. It just annihilated. Yep. Oh, there's like a whole thing with like boats specifically exploding, where like because of pressure waves, they're like it's like an airburst. Basically, you get a lot more 
juice out of the blast that causes a lot more damage. That was a big part of the Halifax explosion too, right? Another yeah. problem with it is is on a boat you happen to have an abundance of fuel oil. <laughs> yeah, all, all the all the good also, all the good explosive uh, stuff. No, all uh, right. So let's stop talking about exploding boats and let's talk about <laughs> an exploding car. Okay, original digression. So I basically like whenever. <gasps> <laughs> what's what's <laughs> the derail got derailed? Okay, like I said, ten seconds. Scott. All right. The P6M, the jet yeah. powered. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. It could, okay. It, it could hit almost Mach one on the deck. No. Wait. 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 P6M. I, I'm googling this right now. Mach zero point nine. That's incredible. Wow. Okay. Here. Here's. Here's what we need. And we need to. We need to uh, is that the Delta winged one? Yeah. No, it's like it's still an just, interceptor. It's the most it's recent still, one. Okay. It's still just swept back. It's not. It's not Delta. So okay. what you're saying is there is an unbroken record for a supersonic flying boat. Uh, near supersonic. No, remember that was on no, no, the no. Deck. no, 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 no. That one's near supersonic. I'm saying there is a record to be broken for a supersonic flying boat. Yeah, you had the supersonic fighter jet. I don't, I, I don't know what the application uh, for that is, other than it's cool. But hey, what more motivation do you need? But back to the back to the episode. Anyway, yes. <laughs> So we've talked about exploding planes, exploding boats. Let's talk about an exploding car. All forms of transportation can explode. So Truax wants to build this steam rocket and he designed it so that it could be throttleable and he set it to a pedal in Arfon's car. The idea was to let Arfon's open the throttle slowly and build speed. Except when he demonstrated it in front of the press, Arfon's slammed the pedal so hard it broke a valve and stuck open pushing the car to aircraft speeds in seconds and making it spin out and crash and explode immediately. Arfon somehow managed to walk out of this unscathed. That's the, that's, wow. <laughs> that's the daredevil <laughs> right stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, but also just like you have the rocket, it's hooked to the pedal, you slam it down so hard that you break it. And then you are just immediately no longer in control of this situation. It's the machine that kills you instantly. <laughs> it is. You have a button. You have a lever in your cockpit that just has die written on it, and you slam it so hard it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's got the right stuff. We are going to talk about... Um, buttons and levers that kill you instantly because this does come up into the story and Truex does engineer for it. Wonderful. <laughs> the human now, liquefaction device. <laughs> <laughs> this machine will turn a human into a soup like homogenate within 30 the, the seconds. The HLD, yeah. Every, every rocket needs an HLD. <laughs> now, you might expect a little failure like this to put kind of a, a blemish on Truax's career, either at his real work at Aerojet or in his extracurricular projects but you'd be wrong. This actually put him in the news and put him on the path to meeting the true hero of this story, Evil Knievel. I am mentally rotating clapping hands in my mind because at the same time, if you think about it, these men were always destined to meet. Yeah, yeah. But also, also just like you hear about this rocket guy in the news. OK, so I shouldn't I shouldn't say it like that. What actually happened is dumber. So for those who don't know, Evil Knievel was a legendary motorcycle stunt performer and a legitimate American cultural icon. He was the motorcycle's jump guy. And in 1966, he was looking for something new. According to him, he got the idea to jump across the Grand Canyon while drinking in a bar and looking at a picture of it on the wall. The more he drank, the smaller the gap looked until he decided, yeah, I can jump that. Which I do think is, is incredible. Alcohol-induced like, psychosis. Slowly leaning over the bar as you, like, squint sideways at the picture. Just, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, it's so hard to be. I got it. <laughs> so he immediately sent off a letter to the government asking for permission. They didn't say yes, but they also didn't say no, so he just sort of went ahead with it. He spent the next two years trying to wrangle the rights to build a takeoff ramp from the Navajo tribes that owned the land, who said no. And only then, after two years, did he get a response from the government, who also said no. With the Grand Canyon effectively off-limits, Knievel started shopping around for other big natural ditches, and he found the Snake River Canyon in Idaho, where a family had a small ranch going right up to the edge. So he leased the property, built a ramp, and started working on his jet bike. He did this by buying some old surplus rockets and bolting them to a motorcycle. Just winging it. Just redneck engineering his, his 
death defying jump. And when he showed it off as a way to drum up press for the canyon jump, an aerospace engineer named Doug Malawicki saw it and was so horrified of Knievel's Frankenstein rocket that he offered to build him a real rocket bike that wasn't guaranteed to kill him. No, it'll just kill him when he <laughs> crashes into the side of a canyon yeah. instead. So if, so if you want help, if you want someone to work for you for free, just threaten to like do it yourself and die. So and then if they yourself. and then they will come in and help you. I <laughs> yeah. think I think just the catch there, though, her- is you do have to be, you can't bluff that you got to be willing to go through like you got to be committed to that. I think if anyone could ever be said to be willing to do dumb and stupid lethal stuff, it would be Evil Knievel. (laughs) So basically, for a jump this big, you need a takeoff speed of 400 miles an hour. You have to fly a decent distance, like you need aerodynamics, wings, parachutes. Even if the rider wasn't flung off, a motorcycle would not be stable in flight and would spin out. To jump a canyon like Snake River Canyon, you don't need a motorcycle with rockets. You need a rocket with wheels. Malawicki had experience with aircraft structures, but he didn't know anything about rocket engines. So he went to Aerojet and asked them for help. What is the glide ratio of a motorcycle with a human on it? (laughs) It's very relevant to our line of work, Quinn. The answer is no. It could be. (laughs) (laughs) So Aerojet agreed and quoted him a number in the millions, which was way outside Knievel's budget. But then they also mentioned that one of their department heads like worked in the basement and loved doing stupid projects and maybe he'd help them. And Truax was ready to go and snort that <laughs> fridge mold. So Malawiki approached Truax and again, he agreed instantly. Oh, of course. This man is incapable of saying no to anything. Any question with the word no. rocket in it. It's because he hears a challenge. And I mean that in the best sense. He will hear a challenge and go, all right, bet. All right, let's do it. He, he so evil Knievel's drinking in the bar and like looking at the picture of the Grand Canyon to get his bright ideas to inspire his confidence. Truax is doing the same thing. Well, like looking at pictures of like rocket designs he's drawn <laughs> Listen, on the bar both napkin. Of, both of yeah. their eyes are floating in their skull and they say, hey, let's do it. <laughs> Slide 32 to give you an idea. Oh, boy. There's a there's a little bit of environmental storytelling on that image to tell us how this will go. Also a Japanese imperial flag. Oh, that, there's a story there. So it looks there, like there will be a story later. Are you saying that there might have been an aircraft carrier in the vicinity of this launch? <laughs> <laughs> He's kamikaze into it. Deploying evil Knievel in the manned cruise missile. <laughs> I was just thinking that, too. Missile. <laughs> What was what was the name of that? What was the name of that thing again? He wanted help, so he went to like surviving Oka pilots from World War II and got like, <laughs> Jesus how did Christ. you do it? He how did you ride the rocket? <laughs> <laughs> so my my first question here is: so looking at this thing for if people aren't looking at the slides, it looks exactly like the Bell X One in my head. And it also has the fra- the words X2 painted on it. Hold on, because this is the this is actually the second iteration. Okay. So the first rocket was the X-1. Uh, Just like with Arfon's race car, Truax figured that a steam rocket was the best and safest approach. His rocket was even just a copy of the one he'd put on Arfon's car. Malawiki, meanwhile, designed the rocket and hired out the construction to a local metal shop. However, they fucked up the build so bad that anyone trying to ride the thing was guaranteed to die. So, for example, they didn't weld the fins to the actual structure underneath. They just welded it to the outer skin of the rocket. (laughs) So any any attempt to use this thing, the fins would have immediately ripped off and the thing would have either spun out or just like crumpled. Remember back in this story when we said his buddy was the structural engineer? Yeah, I'm starting to think he needed that buddy like. (laughs) <laughs> his, his friend is missing. He needs to bring his friend here for this guy trying to weld the, the, the fins directly to the skin. What he needs here is an accountability buddy, and it is this man. <laughs> so in fairness, this is Malawiki and not uh, Truax. Truax's stuff somewhat works. So whenever whenever they see the X-1, whenever it's ready, Knievel immediately fires Malawiki and he just had Truax design the whole thing, structure and all. The X-2 was entirely Truax's work and it was a beautiful Frankenstein nightmare. One thing you notice with Truax is he loves basically doing Junkyard Wars stuff. Uh, if you haven't seen that show, please go look it up. Oh it's amazing. Oh my God, I want to. No, if I had a genie's if I had the, you know, the genie's lamp, just junkyard wars between historic figures. Oh, oh my dude, God. that would be so cool. So so for those who don't know, Junkyard Wars, and I think it was it was originally a British show whose name I'm forgetting. Junkyard Wars was a show where 
two teams would be set loose inside of a literal junkyard and told to build something. And that something could be like a car. It could be a plane. For today's episode, we have Leonardo da Vinci versus Howard Hughes. (laughs) I'd watch the crap out of that. So so basically, like Junkyard Wars is Truax's entire engineering ethos. Uh, And I'll give you an example for the X-2. The hot water tank was an old oxygen tank off a B-29 bomber. The nose cone was the tip uh, tank of a Grumman Goose. The gyroscopes came from old Nike Ajax missiles. As one has casually lying around, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, he's he's also he works at Aerojet, so he has access to the Aerojet. Oh, I see. Access to a crystal ball. They can just say, I want a long, narrow fuel tank. So like your local scrapyard and the scrapyard that he has access to, his scrapyard has useful rocket stuff lying around. Yeah, so I'm going to go um, I'm going to go walk around the U.S. Air Force Boneyard. So he's finding all of this dumb rocket stuff just around and it gets even better from Great Mambo Chicken. Quote, Truex invented the rest of the craft himself, including the parachute deployment system, a complex Rube Goldberg machine that involved a gun that fired a slug that tore the lid off the parachute canister. The drogue chute was attached to the canister lid, and when the lid came off, the chute would be pulled out by the slipstream. I am a parachute engineer. This is a bad idea. (laughs) The gun is just going to punch a hole! Yes, so inside of this rocket, you have a gun that fires, and this is like part of the system. My brother in Christ, have you never heard of, I don't know, maybe a blank and a rod inside of a cylinder? (laughs) Even just like a cutter. A cutter is a thing. But no, I I do appreciate, like, he probably just had a gun lying around. It was just like, fuck it. Oh yeah, he just saw, he saw Colt There's just a string tied to the trigger. I do love that his Junkyard Wars-esque vehicle has a gun on it, so this is straight, like... This is this no could Mad be, Max. Yeah, it's Mad Max. I was just thinking this guy should have been on the set of Fury Road making all those. Like, you <laughs> imagine like this, that this thing would be fit perfectly cruising around next to the flamethrower guitar. I, it would be over too fast. Now, Truex built two copies of the X-2, one for testing and one for the real deal. By this time, it's late 1974. The basic idea of the rocket was simple. Knievel would open the throttle and it'd accelerate to 400 miles per hour over four seconds and blast over the canyon. So, which is about a half mile across and 600 feet deep. The rocket had a rudimentary autopilot that'd keep it from spinning out and deploy the parachute once Knievel had cleared the canyon. So, when asked about this, Knievel was strangely fatalistic about the jump. Right now, I don't think I've got better than a 50-50 chance of making it. It's an awful thing. I can't sleep in it. I toss and I, I turn and I all I can see is that big ugly hole in the ground grinning up at me like death's head if the heater doesn't blow up and scald me to death on the launch ramp if the countdown goes right if the sky cycle goes straight up and not backwards if it actually reaches 2,000 feet if the shoot works if I don't hit the wall at 400 miles per hour and if I can get out of there when it lands I win if it doesn't work I'll split the canyon in the eye just before I hit it. (laughs) Then again, I've got five backup systems. The fifth one is called the Lord's Prayer. (laughs) (laughs) Thoughts and prayers for evil can evil. (laughs) He could just like his whole job is doing dangerous stuff. So it's in his interest to make this sound uh, dangerous. But at the same time, at this point in American history, it really is. Hey, buddy, you're probably going to die. You want to say a little something? Yeah, but like. It's crazy him that just that sentence, like he's saying it, like it's fatalistic, like somehow he's being forced into this. Like he's not <laughs> choosing to do this. You can yeah. stop at any time. Mr. Knievel, <laughs> you can simply walk away. <laughs> and Knievel had good reason to be worried. Truex's idea of testing was about as slapdash as his engineering. Because he couldn't find or build a wind tunnel, he just bolted a scale model to the front of his El Camino and drove up and down the highway taking notes. <laughs> so... So I've done this. <laughs> yeah, but we're not working for evil Knievel. I, okay, I've 100% done this <laughs> for like engineering <laughs> design competitions to get to get shit up to speed to test it. Just literally, literally a thing on a stick, putting out a window, driving at highway speeds <laughs> at night when nobody was there and no cops were around. Connected yeah. to a, um, God, what's, what are words for force measuring devices? Stick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure, stick. Uh, <laughs> Oh my god, what? Load cell! 
load cell. Okay. There's the word a connected load, to a yeah. load cell. Yeah, no, this has been done. Just anyway, okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had, had to point that out. So there would only be two test flights before Knievel's big jump. The first test used the old X-1. The rocket even Knievel didn't want to ride. But what Knievel didn't know was that Truex deliberately fucked up the test to generate some media buzz and make it seem more dangerous so he could sell the film rights. <laughs> because it'd be more exciting if the test rocket crashed, Truex sabotaged the engine and made it burn only a fraction as long as it should have. As predicted, it slammed into the center of the canyon at, right on target for Truax. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> a maniac. Yeah, and he's fully just like going to the media like after this rocket has exploded and just going like, uh, that'll be 50 bucks, please. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're, you're filming this? All right, you're going to have to sign this form. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the second test launch was a full dress rehearsal with the extra X2 Sky Cycle. This one had the full loadout and was expected to reach the other side of the canyon. It even had rudimentary controls and an autopilot, since the seat was occupied by a crash desk dummy named Fred Galahad. Like the first test launch, this one also failed, but not intentionally. The drogue chute deployed before the rocket even left the ramp, and the main chute was open before the rocket's engine was empty. Witnesses describe it basically doing the cartoon character thing, where they hang in the air momentarily before falling like a rock. It crashed into the center of the canyon, although this time, instead of breaking, the shock absorbers worked, and it just wound up sticking out of the ground like a lawn dart. So you sure this wasn't piloted by Wile E. Coyote at this particular yeah, moment I mean, in time? It fits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Truex actually got pretty worried about this. The dressed rehearsal test was just two weeks before the big jump, and he needed time to sort out this parachute issue. But Knievel wouldn't budge. First off, the failed tests were getting him a lot of attention, and he knew that they'd draw bigger crowds if he didn't delay his flight. Second, Fred Galahad had survived, so even if the parachute deployed early, Knievel probably wouldn't die. Third, and most important, delaying would cost Knievel around two million bucks a day. So Truex and his team worked non-stop trying to find the problem, and when they did, it is probably the most relatable engineering moment I've ever heard. So there were two main conduits running through the rocket, one for sending command signals and one for relaying sensor uh, readings to the rocket's black box. What they discovered was that when both cables were plugged in, the parachute deployed early. When only the command cable was attached, the, the parachute worked fine. Somewhere in the mess of electronics and cabling, someone had fucked up. What is cable management? Exactly. But Truex and his team never figured out what the problem actually was. There was no elegant fix. They didn't have time to make one. Instead, they decided to rip up all the rocket's electronics and go completely analog. Oh boy. So they're like, they're like a few days out right now. And yeah. they're saying, well, fuck it, just rip cables out and we'll make it yes. work. With the automatic parachute system gone, Truex rigged up a simple dead man switch that Knievel would hold in his hand. When he let go of the trigger, the parachute would deploy. Truex told him, You watch the horizon out there in front of you. When you see more than sky, then you let go of the lever. In case even that was too complicated for Knievel, he also had a big stopwatch bolted into the cockpit. When the hand reached into a red shaded area, he'd release the parachute. If the hand reached a little skull and crossbones symbol, he'd waited too long. So flat out the uh, timing mechanism from Back to the Future. Yeah. And we talked about how like Truax is going to design in like the button that kills you. Like he fully has on the stopwatch a if you are seeing this, you are already dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he took the time to put that in. That is not a helpful indication in the fucking yeah. slightest part in my language. So over the course of a few days, the X-2 went from a well-engineered autopiloted launch vehicle to a manual pressure cooker on wheels. I just I just want to stop for a second because like reality check for all these people here. I understand there's a media hype thing. They're probably some sort of news cycle they're trying to hit. But some pressure. at any point, these guys could not do the thing. They could even do it next year if they wanted to. Yeah. There is no reason. Other than trying to hit some sort of media cycle <laughs> that they are second. targeting this date. Back up, Scott. Are you telling me that as engineers, they could have potentially said, I don't think this is safe? <laughs> yeah. I, 
Yeah, but I mean, both Truex and Knievel probably thought it was fine. Like, these are both guys who have a very different tolerance for risk than us. Understandably so. So when the day finally rolled around, the press asked both men why they were doing this. Answers are honestly kind of enlightening about the differences between these two men. So Knievel. I like to live with a lump in my throat and not in my stomach. A man is meant to live, not just survive. Meanwhile, Truax. I can't get enough of it. I just like to go out and play with rockets. And I cannot fault him for that in all honesty. <laughs> You've got one guy doing this like, I'm doing this because a man is meant to live, damn it. And Truex is just like, the noises are sexy. <laughs> the guy's like, I like rockets. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like Aerojet's paying me a million bucks a year to play with rockets. And this guy's also play- paying me to play with rockets. <laughs> While Truex got the rocket ready and the water heated up, Knievel gathered the crowd and started his big launch day speech. He's got a band. He's got a $22,000 diamond and gold pimp cane. He has TV part personality David Frost, who is the guy who did the Nixon interviews, and he has a Catholic priest on stage with him. To top it off, he has his private jet fly down the length of the canyon and do a flyby for the crowd. There's only one problem. Behind the scenes, Truax's propane heater that he uses to like heat up and build pressure in the rocket has died which meant that the rocket was as hot as it was ever going to get, and every minute Knievel wasted on his pageant made the engine weaker and the launch more dangerous. So the single point of failure on this machine is the same thing I use to cook my hamburgers. Yeah, and the single point of failure on this machine has now failed. Yeah, we're about we're about to toast evil Knievel and then to a nice crisp medium <laughs> rare, just like my hamburgers. <laughs> just getting those perfect grill marks on evil Knievel's face. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. So, like, they are freaking out behind the scenes. Eventually, this got to the point where Truax interrupted the ceremony during a long prayer by the priest, demanding that they shut up and get moving. (laughs) Shut up. Stop talking to God. Stop talking to God. I'm about to meet him anyways. (laughs) So they started the launch prep, but Knievel still had one last trick up his sleeve from Great Mambo Chicken. Quote. Rather than simply climb down from the speaker's platform, walk to the end of the launch ramp and climb up a ladder to the rocket, which to an ordinary person is the only conceivable way of making the trip, Knievel had chosen to add an extra measure of dramatic tension to the proceedings. And so now an enormous construction crane that's been standing by the whole time guns its engines and starts moving its long blue boom over toward the platform. It lowers a bosun's chair, a mobile astronaut's seat, and Knievel hops onto it, then swings out over the crowd. He got into the rocket, and they started the countdown. And on zero, the rocket streaked down the ramp at 400 miles an hour, crushing him into his seat. And then, before it even reached the end of the ramp, the drogue chute deployed. And before the engine was even empty, the main chute was out. How this happens remains a matter of debate to this day, because the electronics were gone. There was, that can't be the cause of it. Truax maintained that Knievel had simply let go of the trigger too early. Knievel said he heard the drogue hatch get ripped off and thought that the airflow had torn it free. So, uh, and you can see a picture. I'm going to go ahead and blame, hey, you were pulling random cables out a couple days before. Might have had something to do with it. I'm cutting (laughs) random cords might have caused this problem. Look, I'm going to go to my gaming PC PC right now with a pair of scissors and start snipping and and see what happens. The gun just went off prematurely. (laughs) The gun that fires the parachute (laughs) accidentally went off. Listen, I'm going to go into my favorite program, Kerbal Space Program. (laughs) <laughs> tell you that you're wrong. Uh, now, Your Honor, uh, I can assure you that this worked in Kerbal Space Program. This looks exactly like when I fuck up the staging in Kerbal Space Program. Ah, oh, no, oh, there's yeah. the drug. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay, well, sorry, Jeb. <laughs> ah, revert. <laughs> anyway, on the flight, Knievel actually made it over the canyon, and then his parachute inflated and the wind pushed him back in. So it's at this point that things kind of went like even more to shit. See, Knievel couldn't swim, and with his rocket slowly drifting toward I, okay. a river. <laughs> no, 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 we're not escaping this. This, this, uh, is, this is the thing that's going to do him in after all, every possible thing that could have, they, they could yeah. kill him in this scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, back it up. We are not going to escape this. I will not let you escape this. He couldn't <laughs> swim. He couldn't swim. That is life. That is survival skill number <laughs> negative one. And right there, you can see the path that he followed. So his rocket does make it 
the length, like it makes it over to the other end of the canyon and then it just drifts right back towards a river. Um, <laughs> so of all the ways this man could have died, burned to death, crashed into the side of a canyon, crashed into the ground, like turned into like yeah. spaghetti. He, the thing that almost killed him was the fact that he couldn't swim. <laughs> So he so he's trying to do what he thinks is reasonable and bail out of the rocket. And because the rocket was nose down, boiling hot water was starting to leak into the cockpit. <laughs> Knievel had a personal parachute, but Truex had told him to always stay with the rocket if that was possible. If it landed while he was out of his seat, Knievel would wind up mashed in with the shock absorption springs in the front of the rocket. Since he knew his best chance of survival was to just stay in the rocket and get rescued, Truax and his ground crew tried all kinds of ways to keep Knievel occupied so he wouldn't accidentally get himself killed. So they have him on walkie talkie and they just tell it like basically tell him to do the hokey pokey to like prevent him from jumping out. <laughs> so they tell him to open up his visor. They told they tell him to wave to the crowd. They tell him to close his visor, open it again. And it actually sort of worked. Knievel survived, though he did manage to get his face cut trying to just raise his visor. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was pulled up out of the canyon, his first words to Truax were, Well, Bob, that's going to be one hell of an act to follow. What else he got up your sleeve? And this was the birth of the X-3 project, the plan to launch Evil Knievel into space. So is that a joke you're making or is this a serious thing? <laughs> this is a serious thing. This is no why way. the X-2 has a Japanese like imperial flag on it. So despite winding up in the water, the X-2 was a huge success for Knievel. Crowds didn't care whether he made it across. They cared that he'd come so close to dying and had come out alive. And ways to follow it up were difficult. One idea, proposed to a bunch of Japanese businessmen, was to have Knievel ride a rocket over Mount Fuji. Truex thought it was possible, but not economical. Somehow, what he convinced himself was economical was making Evil Knievel the first private astronaut for a million bucks. So Knievel gave him a research grant of $300,000, but quickly dropped out of the program altogether, since he had legal troubles and not enough cash left. But Truex had an idea, and he powered on with it. He was going to build the X-3, which he called the Volks rocket, or People's <laughs> rocket. Uh, yeah, a bit of German thrown in there. Uh, he is not related to Operation Paperclip, as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> So he's going to build this people's rocket and he's going to use it to launch the world's first private astronaut. This is like late 70s. Oh my God. Now, the first problem was actually designing and building the rocket. The idea here wasn't to actually reach orbit. It was just to launch a person onto a suborbital trajectory where they'd reach space and then fall back down. Ah, So it's the, the Richard Branson special. Yeah, this is good because it means you don't need a very big rocket. You can do it with a rocket the size of a telephone pole. Uh, so this is similar to what Copenhagen suborbital is trying to do, if you know them. This is what Blue Origin and Virgin Orbit, or sorry, Virgin Galactic, both. Yeah, we are technically by some legal definition in space. Therefore, we can all clap. Yeah, but the X-3 is also a Truax rocket. And like everything Bob Truax designed, it was made from a collection of scrap parts that are both scary and impressive. Here's an example. The X-3's engines were four LR-101 rockets that Truex found in a nearby scrapyard and bought for 25 bucks each. What world does this man live in? And why don't I, don't I live know. in it? Uh, you could say it's like, well, it's the 50s stuff. This is the 70s now. <laughs> so these are not big rocket engines. These are what are called vernier thrusters. And their job was only to help steer bigger rockets like the Atlas. But Truex figured if he crammed enough of them close together, he could get his astronauts into space. Quinn, you need to understand, in the U.S., that period between the late 50s and early 80s is just a, it is goo. And like, it's just goo. That's it. There you say none. tiny. But like when I picture like a tiny rocket, I'm picturing like a firework like this is these are each of these rockets is maybe like two or three feet long. But in the, in the sense of like big launch vehicles, but in the sense of a big launch for vehicle, picking up for twenty five dollars at like a, yeah. a scrapyard, like I spent that much money on like a remote control aircraft DC motor. This man is just casually picking up rocket engines for that this cost is, uh, for reference, because I was adjacent to this. A Straight six Jeep engine 
is usually 200 to 300 dollars and how much are you getting your rocket parts for so I, I presumably he wouldn't tell this to the uh the candidates so truex's next problem was money as small a rocket as the x3 was it was still a rocket and thus incredibly expensive truex's first try was to mortgage his house when that wasn't enough he landed on an interesting idea see he had another problem finding an astronaut to launch and he decided, because this was a private launch, that his test pilots should pay him for the privilege of riding his literal <laughs> junk rocket into space. He put out ads in the local paper looking for fit candidates with $100,000 of cash on hand. This would 100% work today. Yeah. I, just saying. I hate He it. found a lot of volunteers, but most of them didn't have money. These people mostly became his assistants, working for free in the hopes that he'd notice them and eventually offer them a free ticket. The first person with actual money was test pilot Gianna Yeager. Even then, Truex took her money, then basically treated her like a normal volunteer, asking her to help uh, him build a launch pad. She did that, but eventually got sick of Truex and left for a different project. She did not get the money back. Jaeger would join Bert Rutan in becoming the first pilots to fly around the world in a single flight in 1986 on the Rutan Voyager. She immediately finds better things than working for this guy. Probably saved her life. Yeah. So his next candidate actually kind of rules. And I want to dedicate like five minutes of the episode just to talking about him. His name was Dan Correa. He was a Peruvian immigrant who had come to America with $150 to his name. He started small. He got a job at a tortilla factory. Eventually, he convinced his boss to let him go out and sell tortillas on a commission basis. And I had no idea door to door tortilla sales was a thing. <laughs> he sold so many tortillas that the company couldn't pay him in cash and started paying him in stock. He eventually amassed so much stock that he got a controlling share of the company and took it over. So what? <laughs> this guy, this guy immediately like he comes to America. He has no money. He oh, he works his way up to hostile takeover of a tortilla up, factory. If you want to talk about a socialist takeover. <laughs> I this is Hondo P. I love this guy. Is this like a world before like America has any concept of what like any kind of ethnic food is? So they're like yes. blown away by like even the rem smallest amount of spice. So. Now owning his own company, he kept going. He got into inventing. And his niche idea is both impressive and incredibly stupid. The tortilla steamer. <laughs> See, he figured that a lot of people froze their tortillas, but didn't have a good way of reheating them. Put them in the oven and they dry out. Put them in a pan and they get greasy and burnt. So he, yeah, so the, the, like, he makes the tortilla steamer instead <laughs> to allow people to like nicely thaw out their tortillas. He built the first prototype out of his baby daughter's humidifier, and then he put in an order for 10,000 of them and got approved by the Tortilla Advisory Board, which apparently exists. Wait, there's a Tortilla Advisory yeah, Board. But, 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 let's yeah, let's not walk past that one, first of all. <laughs> but like, so this guy's basically successfully doing like the weird kitchen gadget that get advertised on TV at like 12 o'clock at night for all the Except old people who are still awake and have yeah, lines. <laughs> 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 the tortilla similar. This this sounds like that episode of that bit in Arrested Development with like the the cornball or whatever. <laughs> it sells really well in Mexico uh, with no safety standards. Now, so this is around the time he heard about Truax. See, on top of being a tortilla baron, Dan was also a Rosicrucian, which is a sect of esoteric Christianity. Long story short, Dan believed that his ancestors had come from space. So it was his destiny to go back. Oh, my God. So Truex didn't believe any of that, but he saw a motivated dude with a lot of money. So he basically <laughs> just said, sure. Jackpot. <laughs> I see it. I hear you, Tortilla Man. <laughs> <laughs> when the Tortilla Baron shows up at your door and then says that God has told him to give you a shitload of money and you're just like, nice. Why, why is like the only connection my brain can make is in the expanse, the Mormons making the generational starship. Oh God. This, yeah, is, like, exactly. this is like that. <laughs> God has told me to go to space. So here's the problem. Like Truax, Dan Correa was very bad at making electrical implements. His tortilla steamer wasn't sealed, which meant that when someone turned it on, it would vent steam into its own circuitry, frying the entire thing. Somehow this problem only got noticed after 10,000 had already been built, and he'd sent two off to get some kind of government approval. The approval obviously wasn't given, and Correa was left with 9,998 tortilla steaming fire hazards and very little money. 
Uh, he tried to sell them in Mexico where there was a lot less regulation, but that meant he had to sell them a lot cheaper. That is literally the joke from Arrested Development. <laughs> that I was quoting earlier. That's exactly what happens in that show. <laughs> anyway, just wanted yeah, to maybe, let maybe that be known. that's where they got it from. <laughs> from Great Mambo Chicken, quote. He got to $17,000 or $27,000, but then he ran out of money. He lost the bakery, he lost his house, and finally he lost what he had put into the project because he couldn't come through with anymore. That was part of the deal, you know? If you didn't get the whole $100,000, then anything you put in was down the drain because I was spending it as fast as he was putting it in. In fact, I was spending it faster than he was putting it in. And so he lost the whole deal. So basically, Truax took a load of this dude's money and when he came back asking for it because he was now homeless, uh, Truax basically told him to fuck off. <laughs> Poor Tortilla Baron. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A disgraced tortilla baron came to my door and begged not, for money. I'm not, not gonna lie, I did not see this plot twist. It's too good. But Correa was dedicated, and this is why he rules, and he was a little obsessed. He went back to Peru for a few years and then came back with a new invention, a special type of mortarless brick. It already existed in Peru, but Correa had uh, convinced the inventor to let him build it under license in the U.S. He did this, according to him mostly to support Truax and earn his spot as the first private astronaut. Unfortunately, it was not to be. He couldn't convince anyone to move over to the new brick because of new regulations and like the cost of retooling. After this, Correa and Truax went their separate ways. I have not been able to find any other traces of Dan Correa outside of this story, unfortunately. What? This He remains my favorite. This is just a random turn of a... Oh, okay, but you know what? Some yeah. people are just entrepreneurially minded, I guess. Yeah, you and start and so dedicated to meeting his space ancestors. I really feel like Truex could have started a cult. Like, he seemed like he was pretty good at convincing at least this one dude. Hold that thought. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are, are we getting to the point in the show where I feel bad for saying I really wish I was this guy and lived his life? <laughs> Uh, I mean, like the worst, the wor <laughs> admittedly, the worst thing that he's done is stole twenty seven thousand dollars from a homeless guy. That's pretty uh, bad. <laughs> yeah, that is. That is. But we have talked about some much more fucked up people on this show. So that makes him like an angel by comparison. I suppose. <laughs> This guy wasn't a Nazi, so hey. Yeah, exactly. How bad can he be? Now, Correa and Jaeger represented the high point of Truax's volunteers, but he also had to deal with a lot of what he called crazies, UFO investigators, cult members, or just anyone who really wanted to go to space. Most of this was Truax's own fault because he did everything he could to advertise himself and make sure everyone knew that he was looking for astronauts. He put out full page ads in the Wall Street journals. Quote, wanted, risky capital for risky project, man or woman interested in becoming the world's first private astronaut, must be reasonably good health and able to produce $100,000 in spendable money. So it's just like, <laughs> I have two requirements. One of them is that you have a pulse. The other is that you be rich as fuck. <laughs> Oh, God. Requirement one is negotiable. <laughs> Requirement <laughs> Depending two on is how rich is fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I just also like to point out that this guy has a, doesn't really have a ton of experience sending people in anywhere, right? It's been all ICBMs yeah. and, and whatnot. And, and there's like his whole thing, like his whole big thing going back to Sea Dragon was about like, if you're going to do the big dumb rocket, you cannot put people on it because the reliability requirements suddenly skyrocket. <laughs> I think at this point, he's just like, ah, the reliability requirements, human life, not that valuable, whatever. Like They volunteered. <laughs> they volunteered, therefore they don't matter. <laughs> now, his big break came in 1980. When he showed up on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and I have here a recording that we're going to listen to. I think you'll find this next gentleman fascinating. He's a retired captain in the United States Navy. He's a uh, pioneer in the rocket, missile, and space fields. He was head of the military space program during the 1950s. He originated the Polaris missile program, and he's designed and built his own workable, we think, space rocket. Would you welcome Captain Robert Truax? Unworkable, we think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really find this fascinating. I was watching the news the other night, and you uh, you fired this uh, 
fired this thing up a little bit, right? Oh, four engines. Full time. Now, when you first read about this, you say, hey, some some nut, excuse me, went out and built his own rocket. But it's all right. But, it's but, all right. <laughs> I'm used to it. But your credentials are incredible. You um, really have great credentials. Why would you decide to build a working rocket that you you plan to really send into space, right? And space is considered what? You have to get above so many miles before you're considered uh, a space shot. U.S., 50 miles, international record. 100 kilometers, right. about 63 miles. So if you get her up 50, over 50 miles, that's an official that's it. space shot. How long have you been working on this, your, your own rocket? This rocket? Yeah. Uh, since 1974. You say you had but people. Who full, full time since, uh, for about three and a half years. And you've had people who say, Captain Truax maybe has uh, lost a couple of marbles when you announced this? Yeah, now and then, yeah. Yeah. That Most happen. of them. Doesn't that happen with anybody who starts off in some venture that sounds uh, a little bizarre and, uh, and glamorous? They always get put down for it for some reason? Sure, but if they didn't, they wouldn't have anything to talk about afterwards and say, I told you so. Right. You think it's going to work? You bet it's going to work. You bet it's going to work. You bet it's going to work. Yeah. I, I'm having trouble isolating his accent. Yeah, I was completely off the mark with what I thought Bob Truex was going to sound like. I but... mean, you were, you were quoting him in the 1950s, so I think he's got a little bit of old coot in him by that time. Oh, definitely. Just Because that in, that's in 1980. He's in like his 60s at that point. Now, for the next 30 years or so, up until 2004, Bob Truex kept up his work on the X3, leveraging volunteer helpers and getting funds where he could. I know that we've laughed a a lot about Truax so far, but I do want to give him credit where it's due. Truax put more than half a million dollars from his time at Aerojet into the X-3. Between 1980 and 2004, there were seven static tests of the rocket. As you can see from this picture here of this static test, like these were done a lot like the old CB and Seahorse tests. They lit the rocket, then lowered it underwater to see if it would still work. And it did in every one of these tests. He's igniting them above the water, then like lowering them in as it's on? Yes. Another thing to talk about, we can kind of see if you go down to slide 47, you can see how tiny this rocket is. Horrifying. It has a diameter of 60 centimeters or about two feet. Whenever I write an episode like this, I always want to put a little section at the end because this is a show about space failures and Bob Truex was not a failure. He was a brilliant engineer who I believe was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Everything from Sea Dragon to the Volks rocket, these were all good ideas with some solid engineering behind them. The only problem was that they came into being during the Space Dark Age, the period after Apollo when people and politicians stopped caring about space. When funding for government space programs was drying up and no one, no one, wanted to take a bet on a weirdo engineer with a rocket made out of junk. And yet, he kept at it for over 30 years. He really would have been at home in... Like like the post like twenty tens when capital yeah. cost nothing and everyone was doing a bunch of ludicrous nonsense. Whenever like oh dude, venture capital would have thrown so oh, much so money much money at this guy in that era. Like how many of those have we had in the last number of years of like yeah. all kinds of kind of BS space startups? I mean <laughs> <laughs> sorry, eh, let's not go there. <laughs> Too much self reflection. Uh <laughs> Um, I, I, I swear I didn't even do that intentionally, uh, but like even, even some of the ones that kind of got like a little bit more high profile, like even the ones that are successful are not really that successful, but anyway, I, he, he totally would have gotten, gotten capital. Yeah. I know we've laughed at the stories so far about Truax raiding a landfill for spare parts or taking any rich weirdo that wanted to go to space. But it needs to be said that all of these decisions, no matter how hilarious or scary, were the best decisions Truax could have made to keep this program going. The X-3 was made from garbage because that's the best Truax could afford, and it still worked pretty well. I cannot stress enough how hostile the years after Apollo and right up to a decade ago were to space programs, and how big of an accomplishment just surviving through this period was. Engineers with more money and support failed faster than Truax. Basically, while he didn't succeed, he did survive. And I think that is an achievement in itself. Oh, he's he's definitely one. Of, sorry, he's, he's like he's definitely one of these dudes that I, I really wish to see, like if he had been in a slightly later era, what would have happened? There's I, there's a lot of kind of nutty engineers who have some kind of interesting, interesting ideas. I get like, yeah, kind of. I, I think of when I think of Sea Dragon, I think I do think I brought his name up a few times, but I do think of a lot of like Howard Hughes or uh, Caproni or whatever had these ideas for what they thought like the future of like air and they're both their cases air, airplanes were going to be 
but they were just a couple decades too early on both of their accounts. Yeah. Would have been interesting had they, they been around for a slightly different era. I just had this thought of that. There's nothing more devastating for like future thinking technology development than just being ahead of their time. Right. Yeah. And, and like, regardless, like, I do think that whether you can point to like definitive connections or not, I do think that these guys, these like engineers who are just doing weird little crackpot projects all through like the 70s, 80s, 90s, early aughts. I do think they have a big role in like influencing later successful rocket development. Oh, absolutely. Right. Even if they're not like like they're sp- almost like spiritual descendants. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in 2004, Bert Rutan, the guy who Gianna Jaeger had gone to work with, beat Truax to his dream. Rutan's Spaceship One became the first private crewed spacecraft to reach space. Truax retired from working on the X-3 after 2004, and he died in 2010 at the age of 93. If you do the math, that means that he was 87 when he stopped working on the X-3. From his childhood designing his own rocket fuel, through Naval Academy, through Aerojet, working with Evil Knievel, and finally on the X-3 Volks rocket, Bob Truax worked on rockets uninterrupted for almost 80 years. I want to be this guy when I grow up. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I know, I know I'm like, I'm like too old to want to be somebody when I grow up, but uh, here we are. Yeah, no, seriously, for all his faults, he is truly amazing. And that, everyone, is the story of the largest rocket ever designed and the engineer who designed it, Bob Truax. But because I wanted to end things on a bit of a high note, Bob was not the last Truax to try and launch a stuntman over a canyon. Yes! In 2016, stuntman Eddie Braun rode an exact replica of Evil Knievel's X2 Sky Cycle over Snake River Canyon and landed successfully on the far side. The rocket, named the Evil Spirit, was built by Bob Truax's son, Scott. Runs in the family. (laughs) The only changes Scott made to the original design was fixing the gun parachute system. Uh... (laughs) Which, good job, Scott. (laughs) If you think about the, you know, complete theory of Robert Truax, that was the one thing he could not do. Stop. (laughs) Oh, good. He couldn't design a parachute. It wasn't in his nature. He could not. The man could not stop. Why would you slow down the rocket? (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to design a parachute that makes it go faster. It's a sail. (laughs) If we put it on the front. So for both Scott and Eddie, as well as like, they also got the Knievel family members to come and help out with this thing. This jump was about proving the original could have worked if not for the parachute and also just like being a memorial to the the men who had worked on it originally. I'm going to assume just given that story that they also did not replicate the ripping out all the electronics uh, <laughs> like a week before. Now, did he know how to swim? Now, what they have forgot uh, about I is hope the so. rocket, the rocket accelerated landing. <laughs> He's getting shot <laughs> to the floor. And that, everyone, is where we are going to cap off our series on Sea Dragon, the largest rocket ever designed and the truly weird dude who designed it. How's everybody feel? I feel inspired. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like unlike unlike most of the times that we are covering a subject material of a man who's quite, you know, who's, you know, questionably sane. Um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like Bob Truax is like at least a little redeemable, you know, like I didn't yeah. say psychotic he's, was bad. He's weird. And I thought his design was kind of dumb. But I mean, he's got passion and he's never let anyone say that, like, hey, you're a dumb idiot. You should stop. He's just always. He's just always followed his own dreams, and I think that's worth a lot more. And I, I know we kind of got past it with a lot of the, I guess, inspiring stuff at the end, but like just the fact that he repeatedly said yes whenever he worked, whenever like he was holding a job while he was working with Evil Knievel, he was still working at Aerojet. He did like he worked on the rocket car on the side for a good chunk of his career. These were side projects, and just like 
like my hobby is launching is almost killing evil Knievel. I think it's so <laughs> cool. Oh God. So Scott, thank you so much for coming on this series. Uh, we've incredibly enjoyed your insights. Oh, insights. My, my quote unquote expert opinions. Yes. About how As, cool flying boats are. I think of all my opinions, <laughs> that's been the most expertly backed well, you one. You did also give us some actual rocket uh, know how for the Sea Dragon side as well. As one of the three founding members, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, no, I decide that you're lying. You are a subject matter. Oh boy. <laughs> I've successfully fooled people. Hooray. We do have the space food in my cubicle, so you are going to be on the space food episode. Oh boy. I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to be on my top out for that one. Uh, I'm not sure how I that, feel that about one, cube uh, food. We we ate some in London and it was actually pretty good. Okay. Because like I, I know I've had this conversation with you at work, Quinn, but I'm of the opinion that eating good quality food is one of life's most like precious joys. I know. And you need to get some variety in that. You eat <laughs> nothing but good food. I eat nothing. You need to you need to experiment with not. You need yeah, to be it's reminded. Like you, appreciate you need to be reminded <laughs> so that you do not take for granted the pleasures you have. Exactly. Yes. It's like you can only know how good you have it if you've had shit. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons. Our cyborg cats are Boss, Matt, Leaf Goose, and Spectre Cohen. Our space dogs, Ben L, Fractal Moonlight, Furious Luddite, John C, Oliver, Tom M, and Zim. Albert Count, seven. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.